Hello, welcome to this session, a part of credit risk management module. Uh, we're going to talk about credit derivatives today. It will be a two part video recording. Uh, today we'll understand basics of derivative products and we'll get introduced to some of the credit derivative products in this video. Uh, derivatives are fundamentally a product or an arrangement where the value of that product right, is derived from or dependent on value of an underlying asset. Now, these products are typically futures, forwards, options, warrants, swaps, etc. We'll talk about them in detail. The underlying asset based on which the value of the derivative product is arrived at could be a commodity like gold, silver, uh, could be oil, could be vegetable, meat, anything like that, or could be a currency, maybe INR, USD, JPY, any of these, or could be any kind of a security like a bond, equity, or any structural product also. So derivatives are sort of designed on some underlying product, and depending on the changes in the value of that product or its features, etc., the value of the derivative product itself changes in the marketplace. It's a contract. So derivative is a contract, like you know, equity is a contract between the company and the investor. A bond is a contract again between the company and the investor, right? So derivative also is a contract between two or more parties. There are some derivatives in which there are more than one party. And these are based on some kind of assets. Assets represent basically ownership in something. Financial instruments themselves represent ownership in something. An equity share represents ownership in a company. The most common underlying assets, I think I've given the example, but just to you know, elaborate more on that could be stocks, let's say equity shares, could be bonds, let's say government securities, could be corporate bonds, young bonds, commodities. I give examples of commodities like gold, silver, you know, any other metal, currencies, even interest rates can be the underlying asset. For example, you can have a derivative product where you, know, you exchange obligations to pay interest rate. You say, you know, I'm going to pay fixed interest rate. Instead, you know, what I will do is you pay fixed interest rate on my behalf, I'll pay you variable interest rate. So that is also an argument that can be done. And you can have derivatives which are based on market indexes also. Indexes are like, for example, in Mumbai Stock Exchange, we have Sensex, which is comprising of 30 shares, right? Bombay BAC Sensex. We have Nifty, for example, in National Stock Exchange. In NYSC also, we have different different indexes like s and Derivatives can be traded in two markets. So like, you know, equities like bonds. Equities are mostly traded on the exchanges, but bonds are traded on OTC. Currencies are traded OTC between two parties, over the counter between two parties. And like that, derivatives can also be traded on the exchanges or they could be traded over the counter. In the derivatives market, the OTC derivatives are a greater proportion of derivatives in investors. That is because typically OTC contracts over the counter or between two parties, direct contracts are typically done by big financial institutions or players. And their value is large. Obviously, two banks you know, writing derivative contracts worth millions of dollars. Whereas typically derivative contracts that smaller investors like you and me will enter into will be typically on the exchanges. Uh, let's say one contract, for example, of a USD INR, typically would be like say 25,000 USD on the Indian exchanges. Whereas in the derivatives market, you can sell $10 million, $100 million USD INR contracts. OTC derivatives are perceived to be generally higher risk. Right? There is a more risk because two parties are directly dealing with each other. There is no exchange mechanism for efficient price discovery. And also the clearing and settlement doesn't happen to the exchange or its clearing house. But in order to reduce the risk, regulators all over the world, specifically after global financial crisis, and in India, some changes started happening even before that, have set up the mechanism for clearing of the OTC derivatives trades also to bring down the risk in the market. For example, all the derivatives trade in India between banks, etc., for foreign exchange or derivatives or fixed income are traded through. Clearing Corporation of India Limited, CCIL, which was an RBI initiative and other banks initiative 
to clear all these things in the Indian market, clearing corporation of India. So they said, for example, all trades in government securities are either settled through RBI's mechanism or on CCI or even when it comes to the fixed income, other securities or to derivatives trade. So CCI and settled this in order to reduce the risk in the market. One of the types of derivatives which has been in existence for a fairly long time or century is what is called a futures contract. Futures contracts are contracts listed on the exchanges, whereas exactly same type of contracts which are not listed on the exchanges are called forward contracts. So forward contracts have been existing for centuries. Futures relatively recent phenomenon few decades back when they started getting listed on the exchanges. Now, Always, the forward contracts are an OTC contract between two parties directly. Right? Futures are similar in nature, but on the exchange, so they are standardized contracts. The terms and conditions have to be standardized. If you want to trade on the exchange, it has to be standard terms and conditions. If I am selling to you, we exactly have to have the same definition and exchange has to make sure that all of us have the same definition and they enforce the same definition of the contract. Forward contracts, for example, for purchasing a crop in advance, you know, a farmer is having raising a crop, he knows in three months the crop will be ready. It could be any crop, so he wants to sell in advance to make sure that somebody is buying that and buying it at a specific date and at a specific rate at a specific place. The other party makes sure that you know, they are getting that crop, it could be wheat, bajra, jawar, anything, that they are getting it on a specific date, at a specific place, at a specific date. Right. So that's why they enter into that contract in advance. So it's called a forward contract. Normal contracts are spot contracts. So you go and buy and pay immediately, or maybe in a day, or whatever, and then settle it immediately. Right? Immediately can mean instantaneously, or could be a day or two days max. Right? So typically, spot contracts are the ones that are settled within two days. Right? Else, you will not call it a spot contract. So forwards existing for a very long time. When they got standardized and they are listed on the exchanges, trade on the exchanges, they are called. Futures contract. It's again a contract between two parties for sale of an asset at an agreed upon price. The price is agreed in advance. Maybe now I am saying that you know I buy a forward contract for selling, let's say USD against INR, let's say on 31st of December of the coming year. Right? On the exchanges, you know, there are typically three months or six months forward contracts quoted to you know buy those contracts only because they're standard, right? they are settled on a specific date. Here is an example, agreement to spell specific quantity of potatoes of a specific quality, right? You will have to specify some grade qualities and sizes and specifications will be there at a specific location. Let's say in Nagpur, Amravati, in Maharashtra, or maybe somewhere in, let's say, near Chennai or Bangalore or somewhere near Patna, right? So the place has to be specified at a specified price. You know, we are going to pay so much price, we are going to buy, let's say, two tons of potato, the price we are going to pay. So who's going to be typically the buyer? The buyer who uses potato, right, in large quantity. Okay? Maybe uh, somebody who runs a fast food chain restaurant and they sell fries, right? So for fries, they, to pay fries, they need to buy potatoes of a certain quality to make sure that their customers are happy. And the seller in this case will be typically a farmer who's going to grow a potato. So futures are listed on the traded on the exchanges, whereas forwards are the OTC contracts, which are not traded on the exchanges. That is the only big difference between these two. Otherwise, by and large, they are same in nature. Of course, when you standardize the product, some features come like you know, exact the it will be of a standard amount, like you know, 25,000 USD, or maybe one ton or maybe one million barrels of oil, right? One ton of potato or something like that. Another derivative contract. So we spoke about forwards and futures. The another one is options, right? In forwards, futures, there is an obligation on both the parties. The one, let's say, who's going to sell the potato, one who is going to buy the potato, both have to fulfill the commitment. Obligation is on both the parties to fulfill the commitment. There's a different product, which is called option, where it is optional for one of the parties, whereas it is obligatory for the other party. So obligation is on one party, other party doesn't have the obligation, they have the option. Option means you can choose to or choose not to exercise your right embedded in the contract. For example, I want, I buy, let's say, a, one option of a particular uh, company, um, let's say XYZ Limited, I want to buy a call option 
today the price of that company's share is let's say 100 on the exchange and i feel that the price might go up in future so i want to lock in at 100 rupees right i should be able to buy at 100 rupees so i look for a contract option contract which gives me the right to buy that share at 100 rupees maybe three months from now and i buy that contract now each contract will have a specified number of shares so let's say that contract says there are thousand shares of that company in that contract at 100 rupees right so overall the value is thousand into 100 one lakh rupees so i can buy thousand shares of that company at 100 rupees three months from now it is an option so i need not buy if at that point in time the price of the share is down to 90 obviously i'm not fooled. i'm not going to buy it at 100 rupees just because i've got a contract i will let the contract lapse i will not exist as the option let the contract go dead after three months because it has a specific time right so it will expire i'll maybe if i really want to buy i'll go and buy it at 90 rupees in the market so if it works in my favor because i'm a buyer of the contract i have the option I will exercise the option. If it doesn't work in my favor, I will let the option lapse, like in this 90 rupees. Now, assuming the price of the share has gone to 120 rupees at that time. Now, I bought, I have a right to buy at 100. Obviously, I'll buy at 100. I'll exercise my option. I'll say, okay, I've got an option. Deliver me the shares, thousand shares at 100. And then I can either keep it or I can sell it at 150, whatever I want to do. This is how options contract work. But that other party is carrying the risk, right? If the shares price goes down, I'm not going to ask that you know those thousand shares from them at my and then if the share price goes up i'm going to demand right so they are getting they're taking the risk either way that's why the person who sells the option contract will ask for some premium if they're going to give you some right they are obliged to fulfill your demand but you are not obliged to exercise the right in which case they are at a certain disadvantage at the instance with their writing the contract itself so they're going to ask for some money which is called option premium it's like you take a car insurance and if something happens to the car, the insurance company has to pay. Obviously, they're going to charge you premium for this car, right? Because if something happens to your car, they are going to compensate. They're not doing it for free. Just like that, in this case, the person is writing the option, giving you that right, will ask for some money. That is also called premium. Just like we call it insurance premium, it's also called option premium. So for buying an option, for buying a right to do or not to do something, you have to pay something that's called that. Now, the options could be call option or put option. Call option gives me the right to buy something. Put option gives me the right to sell something. That is the only difference with, between these two. Again, they have a specified date, specifying underlying security, etc., and specified price. Right? So, I give the example of call option. I have a right to buy, let's say, after three months, 1,000 shares of that company at 100 rupees. Like that, I, I may buy a put option saying that. I have a right to sell 1,000 shares of that company at, let's say, 100 rupees, right? That's called a put option. In either case, the person writing the contract is taking the risk, they're giving me the option. I'm actually using it as a hedging product to manage my risk. So let's say I have the, that company shares. You know, 100 rupees is a good price. I think I've made enough money. I want to sell off after three months. But I want to take the advantage. In between, suppose price goes to 120, I'll sell it at 120. Why wait? Why will you get 100? But I don't want to go below 100 rupees when I'm selling. So I may buy a contract of sale, put option for 100. So I'm now position is secured. I can sell at 100, right? I've got the put option. And actually, I might hold on to the security. If the price goes up, I'll sell that. If the price goes down, I'll sell that 100 to the person from whom I have bought the put contract. So options are a hedging or risk management instrument for one party and transferring that risk to the another party who's an option writer for whom they are going to charge you. The third type of prevalent you know, derivative contracts are called swaps. Swap is exchange, right? For example, swapping my mobile phone with, let's say, my son, right? So we are exchanging the mobile phone. Uh, you can swap any kind of assets, right? It is kind of a barter if we do something like this, right? But swap contracts in financial market could be for some specific reasons. For example, you might agree to swap two currencies. Let's say I expect to get $100 million USD two months from now. <coughs> because you know I have, I have sold something to someone in the foreign markets and they're going to give me 
delivered a project or maybe sold some goods or whatever, right? So two months from now, I'm going to get $100 million USD. Now, currently, let's say the USD rate is high. I feel, you know, I should protect myself of the USD going down. USD going down means rupee becoming strong. So if I sell $100 million two months from now, I will get, when I convert back, I'll get less rupees, correct? Let's say right now the rate is 82 rupees to a dollar. I fear that the rate might come down to 80 rupees to a dollar. So $100 million right now, if I sell, uh, I will get 820 crore rupees at 80 rupees to a dollar, 100 million USD. Whereas if it comes down to 80, I will get only 800 crore rupees two months from now, which means I'll lose 20 crore. Now I have to protect myself against this. So you know, I will enter into a soft contract with somebody who wants $100 million of USD two months from now. That other party may fear from 82 rupees, what if the Indian rupee goes to, depreciates and goes to 84 rupees to a dollar. Today they can buy at 820 crores, 100 million. They will have to pay 840 crores, right? For 100 million dollars. So both parties should have a different point of view on the market for most of these contracts to happen. Even in simple equity or fixed income, one person is selling. So by and large, you know, that person thinks this is a good enough price. It may not go up, so I'm selling. Other person thinks this is a good enough price. It might go up, so I'm buying. Right? So always market exists because two counterparties have a different point of view on the market. Same goes for the soft contracts also. So I give you an example of currency. You can swap commodity. You can swap interest rates also. What is the interest rate swap? I have issued bonds, 10%. Fixed rate, right? So I have to pay to my investors 10% on my bonds. Typically on long term bonds, payment is made every six months. So 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, like that I have to pay. 5% plus 5% will be 10% in the year. Now I feel that uh, the interest rate I'm paying is very high, whereas in the market, the interest rate might come down. So now I will try to find a party which thinks the other way around. The interest rates might go. Now, somebody else, you know, I will strike a deal with them saying that, you know, you pay my fixed rate obligation of 10%. You have issued another bond. I will pay your variable rate obligation. Variable rate is floating rate, which is based on some kind of a benchmark. Now, we have to, of course, arrive at consensus. We do our mathematics and everything that has to happen. That's why typically these transactions are done by bankers. You know, you understand these maths and how markets move, they understand very well, or big corporations. We don't normally small companies don't get into IRS stuff, etc. It's the bigger companies that do it because you need to be very sure of the much more, you know, sort of uh, professional investor to understand market well, right? So you the, your fixed rate obligations will be paid by somebody, you pay their variable rate obligation. Now, depending on how the market is, maybe you will end up paying 12% there, correct? Instead of 10%. But if the as per your view, rates are likely to go down, so you, know, you might end up paying 8%. That party will pay 10% on your behalf, so you have benefited. It can benefit or you can make loss either way, right? So in most of the swap contracts, will either benefit or you make a loss. But in case of options contract, other than premium, you don't have any obligation, so you, know, so you don't make any losses beyond your options premium if you enter into option contract, if you are a buyer of the contract, where it is call or So let's look at now some specific <laughs> credit derivatives products like futures option basically. There are multiple credit derivatives products, right? So credit, what is the what are the credit products? Typically, it's a bank loan, you know, guarantee, uh, it's a bond, for example. Bond is a credit product. You know, by selling bonds, by issuing bonds, the company takes debt. They're not taking equity. So credit derivative products are also forward contracts are there. Futures are there, which are listed on the exchanges. Options are there, and there are some other products like credit default swaps or TRS, total return swaps. There also are something called collateralized debt obligations or CDOs, and there are securitized obligations like asset-backed securities and NBAs, mortgage-backed securities. Again, standardized contracts traded on exchange, OTC traded outside exchange in the peer-to-peer -peer, or in a with the counterparties. Typically, CDS, TRS, CDOs, ABS, NDS are typically OTC products. Now, we'll discuss some of these in detail. Uh, we're not going to discuss all of these uh, in detail. 
So let's discuss credit options briefly. We, we know now what uh, options contract is, right? So <clears throat> credit options can be again either put or call options. Put meaning I have a right to you know, sort of deliver something. If it works in my favor, I have a right to the call for something or for you to do something for me in case it works in my favor. If it doesn't work in my favor, I'll let the option expire. I'll not exercise the option, that's all. So either, you know, it could be a floating rate note, bond or loan, right? So on that, I have an option or assets that package where some credit risky instrument with some payment characteristics and a derivative product, et cetera, are rich. You know, sort of you can either call or you can put, right? So either you can ask to be delivered or you can deliver. In case of credit put or call option, it grants the option buyer the right, but not the obligation. You know, but is mentioned earlier. To sell to or buy from the option seller a specified floating rate reference asset at a three specified price, strike price, right? So this floating rate reference asset, etc., will get slightly more clear when we talk with examples. Again, in case of these derivative products, the settlement mechanism may be either cash or physical basis. For example, let me take some one or two examples. I am buying a call option on USD. So I have a right to demand USD at a specific price. Now, on that day, now today, let's say I have a right to buy USD, let's say at 80 rupees. On that day, the price of USD is 85. So I will like to buy at 80 because I'm, I'm profiting otherwise from market, I have to buy at 85, which is five rupees higher. Now the other party can either deliver me USD, right? Or they can give me five rupees and I can buy at 85 rupees for the market. It's one and the same thing for me, right? So market price is 85. If they give me five rupees, I have my 80 rupees anyway, and I can buy at 80 plus five, I can buy at 85. I have net net, I have bought at 80 rupees only, right? So this is called cash settlement. They're giving me just the difference. And in many derivative contracts, cash settlement is accepted because if the counterparty doesn't have that particular security or that particular currency or commodity to deliver, rather than getting into litigation, you would like to you know, get the difference from them and you know, buy or sell yourself in the market. Okay? That makes a lot of sense. People are not interested in going into courts to enforce the contracts. You know, if it's a forward contract, then you know you might have to take some such steps, which people typically want to avoid. This uh, litigation process is long and it has its own cost. This is an example of a credit option. So we have a put buyer. It's a put case, right? So you have a right to sell something, right? So put buyer, so he's getting a right that, and he's paying some fees to the put seller. So he's a contract writer, right? So contract writer is not going to give you some option for free. Your okay, option is taking the risk, you don't have the risk, right? So you'll pay some X DPS, typically basis points, DPS, one basis point, is basically one hundredth of a percentage. 10 basis point is 0.1%, 100 basis point is 1%. Basis point BPS is very frequently used in the credit markets as a terminology for fixed income. <laughs> now, if that asset swap is exercised, what will happen? Now, this is the first you know, upper portion is when you buy the contract, put, put contract. Lower portion is when you know at the date, the strike date, what you can do. If you want to exercise the contract, then you will give the underlying asset to the put seller and then give the cash. And they will also give you the current prevailing rate in the market, which is typically a floating rate, right? They'll give you for that asset and you will pay them the fixed rate, what is agreed on that particular asset. Now, in this case, when will you exercise? If you're going to get more, then only you will exercise, correct? So, which means that interest rates should be higher. LIBOR plus the floating rate interest should be higher than the coupon rate, then you will exercise this particular if the you are going to get less by way of cash so par value plus LIBOR, then obviously you will not exist in this option, you will let it lapse, right? So, similar way, so you know, put option has the right to sell and uh, the buy option has the right to buy. Credit options, like okay, I think this was not discussed when I spoke option. Options can be either American option, style option, or European style option, whether true or category within that. In European style option, the settlement date or the strike date, like strike price, is fixed. Let's say two months and two days from now, whatever it is, right? So, exact that date. 
in the american style option study the european style in the american style option this the, you can ask the transaction to be done any time from today when you buy the contract till the date of strike the last day right any time you can exercise. so any time it is favorable for you from now till that day you can exercise right so sometimes what can happen you know right in between the uh, option could be giving you the profit but by the time the option strike date comes it may be not giving you profit now american option is more profitable for somebody who is buying it obviously any time they can exercise option and whereas it is more riskier for the person who is writing the option so that's broadly about introduction to you know credit derivative just let's quickly look at what will be covered today so we look at derivative basics what a derivative product is and on what type of assets you can create a derivative products we looked at otc and non otc that is exchange traded derivatives also and we looked at three four main types of derivative products forward and futures options put and call swaps the yeah, four types and then we looked at what are credit derivative products of different different types and then we looked at credit option and in which case you will typically exercise the option and what will happen if you exercise that particular option so thank you very much for patient hearing and all the best